Shalom Aleichem. The peace of God be with you all. My name is Father Mitchell Packman. I'm a Jesuit priest and a professor of Old Testament at Loyola University in Chicago. We've been going through the prophet Micah, Micah of Moreshet. And we've seen how this prophet has gone back and forth between giving threats of judgment and punishment against Judah and Israel and then giving words of hope. Now today we're going to see the last of those cycles of threat and promise as we look at chapters 6 and 7 in the book of Micah. So open up to those texts. Now, when we talked about the prophets earlier, we mentioned some of their forms of speech, one of which is the covenant lawsuit. We've seen this lots of times, haven't we? And it's because the prophets are messengers of Yahweh, the God of Israel, who became the God of Israel when He made a covenant with them at Sinai. And now, as the people break the covenant, the prophets come as messengers from Yahweh to announce to the people, you have gone against Yahweh's laws. You have gone against the stipulations of His covenant. And you've broken relationship. So let's see how this covenant lawsuit works in this text here. In chapter 6, verse 1, it says, Now listen, Shim'u, listen to what Yahweh is saying. Stand up and let the case begin in the hearings of the mountains. And let the, hear, the hills hear what you say. Now, the ancient peoples believed that mountains and hills were very good witnesses to a covenant. So that when the king of one country, like for instance the king of the Hittites, would make a covenant with another king, he would ask the mountains and the hills to be witnesses. Why? Well, for one thing, they can't tell a lie. And they're not going to tell anything, for that matter, but at least they won't tell a lie. Secondly, the mountains and hills will last longer than either king. The kings will pass away, but those rocks and hills won't. So it was a sign for the ancient peoples that this covenant was to last a long time. But now Yahweh is saying, let's have the hills and mountains come in here and witness. Witness against my people Israel. Listen, you mountains, to Yahweh's accusation. Give ear, you foundations of the earth. So it's like Yahweh is speaking to a jury that's composed of the mountains and the foundations of the earth. Why? Because Yahweh is accusing His people. He's having a covenant lawsuit. He's pleading against Israel. And in verse 3, we see Yahweh's words. And as a matter of fact, we Catholics use these words in the Good Friday ceremony, where Yahweh says, My people, what have I done for you, to you? How have I been a burden to you? Answer me. How have I brought, been a burden to you? How have I done bad things to you? Now, the thing that Yahweh is trying to say to the people is that I haven't really done anything that bad, have I? Haven't I been a good God, a gracious God to you? And to bring out the point, he says here, I brought you out of the land of Egypt. I rescued you from the house of slavery. Now, those are the opening lines of the Ten Commandments, aren't they? How Yahweh says, I brought you up out of Egypt, that house of slaves. So he's calling back to the origin and the basis of the covenant, which was Yahweh's great deeds for Israel. And as a matter of fact, in this section here of chapter 6, we have the only time that Micah looks back to the past history of Israel. I sent Moses to lead you with Aaron and Miriam. Moses was the one who gave you the covenant. Aaron was the priest. Miriam was a prophetess. And my people remember, what did Balak that king of Moab plot against you. Now, Balak plotted to have a prophet named Balaam come and say bad words against Israel. And he paid him for it. And yet Yahweh stopped Balaam from saying bad words against Israel. And so he says, Now what did Balaam answer, that son of Beor? 
Well, Balaam didn't answer anything. He couldn't say anything bad about Israel. Instead, Balaam, even though he was a foreigner, prophesied good things for Israel. Because Yahweh put good things into his mouth to say to Israel. So he couldn't curse Israel. And then it said, from Shittim to Gilgal. Now, Shittim and Gilgal are two places, and they refer to the traveling of the Israelites in the wilderness, and Gilgal was their final goal, the place where they crossed over the Jordan to enter into the land of Canaan. Well, it's what, now the people are speaking here in verse 6. And the people are saying, well, okay, we did stuff wrong, but let's do something about it. What should we do? What should we do to make up for our sins from Shittim to Gilgal? For our, you know, having, you know, rejected Yahweh. What are we supposed to do? He said, with what gift shall I come into Yahweh's presence and bow down before God on high? Shall I come with holocausts, with calves when you're old? So the people think I should come here with a holocaust. That is, a sacrifice I would put on the altar and burn the whole calf up. A one-year-old calf and burn the whole thing up to Yahweh. Is that what Yahweh wants? Will he be pleased with rams by the thousand? With libations of oil and torrents? That is, with just rivers of oil? If I did give him all kinds of olive oil, will he be pleased with that? Must I give my firstborn for what I have done wrong? The fruit of my body for my own sin? In other words, should I do human sacrifice because of my sin? Keep in mind that that was forbidden. Okay? Yahweh answers through the prophet Micah in verse 8. You want to know what you're supposed to do? You want to know how you should make up for your sin? I'm going to tell you how you should make up for your sin. In verse 8 it says, That which is good has been to explain to you, you humans. This is what Yahweh asks of you. Only this. To act justly. To love tenderly. And to walk humbly with your God. To act justly means to act well with our fellows, with our fellow human beings. That's what God wants for us. To love tenderly. To love one another with tenderness. Not for what we can get out of one another, not with lust, but with tenderness. And to walk humbly with our God. If we are not humble before God, there's nothing good that we can do. If we are not small before God, We'll never be able to please God. Because if we are proud and arrogant, we make ourselves God. No, we must walk humbly with God. That is what the Lord wants from us. Now stay with us, and we're going to continue to see what Micah has to say to Israel and Judah. Welcome back. We're going through the prophet Micah. Let's take a look at chapter 6 again. And we'll see how in verses 9 through 16, that the prophet Micah is going to also give new criticisms and new threats against the city of Jerusalem and the people who dwell there. He starts off in verse 9. The voice of Yahweh, He is calling to the city. Listen, tribe, and assembly of the city. So he's asking the people of the town to listen. Listen to what I've got to say. Your rich men are crammed with violence. Your citizens are liars. Must I put up with fraudulent measures or the abomination of the short bushel? Must I hold the man honest who measures with false scales or bag of fake weights? In other words, do, I, do you think that if you're going to jip one another, if you're going to use dishonest business practices, you think I'm going to call you honest for that? Is that what you think? Well, the answer is no, I'm not. Therefore, I have begun to strike you down because you use bad and corrupt business practices. I will bring you to ruin because of your sins. You will sow, you'll put the seed in the ground, but you will never reap. You're not going to live long enough to reap your harvest. 
You will press the olive, but never rub yourself with the oil. They used to take olive oil, not only for cooking, but they would put it on their bodies because the land is so dry, and they didn't have these different dry formula things that we have today for our skin. They put olive oil into the skin and massage themselves with it. It says, you press the olive oil, you'll do the work of getting the oil out of the olives, but you won't rub it on your body. You will press the grape, but never drink wine from it. You will eat, but never be satisfied. You won't have enough to eat. You will store away, but never preserve. And what is preserved, I will give to the sword. Doesn't that remind you of the passage in the Gospel, the Gospel of Luke, where Jesus says, you know, a man had built himself barns and filled them up, and he says, now what shall I do? And God says, you fool, because tonight you shall die. You're never going to enjoy that. Well, these rich people who planned to enjoy all their abundant wealth will not do it, because they have sinned. And it's not that riches are the sin, it's the fact that they've sinned that they cannot enjoy the riches. You keep the laws of Omri, and you follow all the practices of the house of Ahab. Now remember who Omri is, huh? Omri was a general, and he overthrew the reigning king of Israel, who had himself started a revolution, and Omri's revolution established a new dynasty. His son was Ahab. And Omri was a very strong king, and he began a process of real wealth and gathering of all kinds of prosperity for himself and for his son Ahab. But he did it through oppression. And again, it's not that wealth itself is the sin. The problem is getting the wealth through oppression and keeping the wealth without being generous to the poor. That was the problem. You are guided by their standards, that is, by the standards of Omri and Ahab, with all their oppression and stealing. And they force me to make a terrible example of you and to turn your inhabitants into a laughing stock to suffer the scorn of the peoples. Because you do this stuff, I have to punish you. My father said that to me all the time. He said, they know, because you, you know, run around and, and you know, play with matches or whatever it might be, you force me to spank you. Now, I didn't believe it at the time, but as an adult I understand better now. Well, Yahweh was the same way. Because the people continue to be oppressive to the poor and selfish and self-centered and not sharing with the poor, Yahweh was forced to punish them like he had punished Ahab and his family. Ahab was killed in battle and all 70 of his sons were wiped out by Jehu in the revolution. Now we go to chapter 7. And we see here in chapter 7 that the first seven verses deal with how corruption is not just in Israel, but it's all over the world. He says, this is God speaking through the prophet, I'm in trouble. I am in trouble. I have become like a harvester in summertime, like a gleaner at the vintage, without a single cluster to eat. In other words, Yahweh has planted a field that he would hope would be a field of righteousness. And he's like a harvester who finds nothing. There's nothing to gather. That's the trouble that he's got. Not one of the early figs that I so much long for is to be found. The devout, that is the people who keep the covenant, the word devout, chesed in Hebrew, means the one who keeps the covenant. The devout have vanished from the land. There's not one honest man left. All are lurking for blood. Everyone hunting down his brother and sister. Imagine that. Hunting down your own brothers and sisters to kill them, to wipe them out. The judge gives judgment for a bribe. The man in power pronounces judgment as he pleases. In other words, they do things for money and for power. They don't care about anything else. They don't care about truth. They don't care about God's justice. They don't care about the poor. They don't care about compassion. Just power and money. Put no trust in a neighbor. Have no confidence in a friend. To the woman who shares your bed, do not open your mouth. For son insults father. Daughter defies mother. Daughter-in-law defies mother-in-law. 
A man's enemies are those of his own household. Among them of the best is like a briar. Does that sound familiar? And would you think that this is being written 25, 2600 years ago? Doesn't it sound like our own society where we have such a high murder rate, but by far most people who are murdered are killed by somebody who knows them. Most murders take place in families. And the kind of rebelliousness that is not only in our culture, but throughout the world, throughout the Western culture anyway, that's what he's complaining against here. Because it existed in his own culture and exists still in ours. Today will come their ordeal from the north. Now is the time for their confusion. For my part, I look to Yahweh. My hope is in the God who will save me. My God will hear me. In the midst of the corruption of the whole culture and of the world around, he says, look, the only hope I've got is God. I must turn to Him. So also in our culture, even though we see all kinds of terrible things going around us, and all kinds of violence and murder and such, oppression and injustice and lies, your hope and my hope is for us to turn to Yahweh, to turn to our God, for He will hear us. We'll be back in just a moment to take a look at the hope for the future that Micah presents to us. Welcome back. We're about to finish up the book of the prophet Micah of Moreshet. If you look at chapter 7, verse 8, we see Israel's hope for the future begin. Now, the first part of this is in verses 8 through 17. And this is hope for the city of Zion. And it's a variety of different kinds of hope. The first three verses deal with hope for Zion that has been insulted by her enemies. It says, Now don't gloat over me, my enemy. Though I have fallen, I shall rise. Though I live in darkness, Yahweh is my light. So, here the city of Jerusalem was beaten pretty badly by Sennacherib in 701. Now, the city was not captured, but the people had to pay a large tribute, and all the other towns were destroyed throughout Judah. And he says, look, I'm suffering a lot, but don't gloat over me. Don't make fun of me, because Yahweh is my light, and He will shine. I believe in Him. He will restore me. I must suffer the anger of Yahweh, for I have sinned against Him. Now, this is important for you and for me too. When we experience you know, our punishment for our sins, it's because we deserve it. And we have to accept that and offer that back up to God. But He will take up my cause and He will right my wrongs. He will bring me out into the light. And I shall rejoice to see the rightness of His ways. When my enemy sees it, she will be covered with shame. She who said to me, Where is Yahweh your God? My eyes will gloat over her. She will be trampled underfoot like mud in the streets. So, this point in the prophet's career has probably already seen punishment and suffering fall upon the people of Judah. But he also speaks for hope that he will see and rejoice to see the rightness of Yahweh's ways. That there will be a restoration afterwards. And so what does it happen with us? Sure, we may undergo punishment personally, but we also can look forward to the moments of grace that Yahweh will give us. The Lord our God who will bestow upon us His mercy and tenderness and compassion. And we can rejoice to see the rightness of His ways. In verse 11, we see another one of these sayings for restoration. Not only is there hope, like we just saw in verses 8 through 10, about a hope for you know, God's grace and God restoring His ways. But now, here in verse 11 and following, we see that there's hope for that day as a coming the day that is coming for rebuilding your walls. 
On that future day, Yahweh will rebuild your walls. Your frontiers will be extended that day, and men will come to you from far, from Assyria as far as to Egypt, from Tyre as far as to the river Euphrates. From sea to sea, from mountain to mountain, the earth will become a desert by reason of its inhabitants in return for what they have done. Now, twofold thing. The enemies will be punished. But on that day of judgment, there will be a restoration of the city of Jerusalem. Its walls will be rebuilt. And as a matter of fact, later on in its history, the walls were rebuilt. Many times. But one of the things we also see is how this becomes just sort of the kernel of another oracle of hope for the future, an oracle of hope that we see in the book of Revelation, where John of the Revelation sees the walls of the new and heavenly Jerusalem, walls with 12 different kinds of jewel, walls that are just brilliant and shining, because Yahweh will rebuild those and invite all of us who have been redeemed by Jesus to live in that new city. Now, admittedly, that this oracle of hope here is one for hope that Israel will have a worldly kingdom and a worldly empire. That's what they look forward to. And an empire that was even larger than the empire of David. An empire which went up to Damascus. But now they hope, under the inspiration of Micah, for an empire that goes all the way to Assyria, that is what we now call Iraq, and goes all the way down to Egypt. Now they never had that kind of an empire. Not in, in regular world history. But they did, you know, you know, come and live again in the land and rebuild the city of Jerusalem. And ultimately, our hope as Christians is not for the restoration of some earthly kingdom, because those all pass away. Such kingdoms always die out. We hope to live in that new and heavenly Jerusalem with Christ. Verses 14 through 17 see another oracle of hope, where the Gentiles will be punished. With a shepherd's crook, lead your people to pasture. The flock that is your heritage. Don't we see this in the gospel too, huh? That Jesus is the good shepherd. And he fulfills this promise by being the shepherd that leads us like sheep. It's up for you and for me, though, to walk humbly before our God like sheep following the shepherd. Now, this flock was living confined in a forest with meadowland all around it. So let them pasture in Bashan and Gilead as in days of old. That is, let them have the old kingdom of Bashan and Gilead, which were very fertile areas to the northeast of the Sea of Galilee. And the pagans will see it, and they will be confounded for all their power. And they will lay their hands to their mouths, and their ears will be deafened by it. So the pagans are going to see that Israel will be restored, and they'll be dumbfounded and astonished that Yahweh has done this, because they're so scattered and destroyed that now they see that, you know, even this people that had nothing is able to have their own nation and their own kingdom. And it will dumbfound the nations and amaze them. They will lick the dust like serpents, like things that crawl on the earth. They will come trembling from their lairs in terror and fear before you. That's what he speaks of there. But finally, something that you and I can really get into, I think, is the last three verses. What God can compare with you, Yahweh? Taking faults away, pardoning crime, not cherishing anger forever, but delighting, notice that, delighting in showing mercy. Once more have pity on us, stomp down on our faults, to the bottom of the sea throw all our sins. Grant Jacob your faithfulness and Abraham your mercy, as you swore to our fathers from the days of long ago. You and I need to reflect on that. That the real hope for us is that Yahweh delights in showing us mercy. We don't have to be afraid of presenting any single sin to God. Our only fear is to hold our sins to ourselves. Our hope is that God delights in showing us mercy for any sin that you and I can do. Let us trust in that mercy. Let us trust in the fact that God takes our sins and casts it to the bottom of the sea and He shows us love, compassion, and mercy. Receive that mercy and love. God bless you. Thank you.